You're listening to Live from Lord North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. This week, the IEA's Christian Nemitz and Ben Southwood, economist and former head of research at the Adam Smith Institute, tackle one of the most critical areas in public policy today, housing. Interviewed by Kate Andrews, the pair discuss the housing shortage, its supply-side nature, and the politics which underpin it. They trace the historical origins of the crisis and look at the well-organised NIMBY movement and its influence on government policy. If you like what you hear, subscribe to our iTunes channel, IEA Conversations. Britain seems to be in a perpetual state of crisis when it comes to housing. Ben, why is this? There is a crisis in the sense that there's not very much housing going around and it's very expensive. But I don't think it's something that's going to come to a head in any way. I think it could just keep getting worse. Why are we in this situation overall? Well, the biggest reason, and I think Christian will agree with me on this, is the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947, which essentially nationalised the, the planning process, which used to be denationalised. Yes, absolutely. To be precise, it's a combination of two factors. One is the very restrictive planning system, which started with the Town and Country Planning Act. Secondly, we also have a very well-organised resistance against development, what is uh, referred to as the NIMBYs, the not-in-my-backyard attitude. That's something which, as a sentiment, exists in a lot of places. That's not specifically British. But what is different here is that here NIMBYs are politically organized. They're not just people sitting in a pub and grumbling about somebody building uh, a maybe unwanted development near them, but they actively mobilize their members and campaign for stopping development. So they would bombard MPs or local planners with angry letters and uh, attend planning meetings and start campaigns to try to stop development. And if you have that combination of a restrictive planning system on the one hand and organized resistance to development on the other hand, so that those groups who are opposed to development can actively use those planning laws to prevent development, then you have a toxic mix. Ben, you say that things may continue to get worse, but rents are already so high and it is near impossible for people, even on good salaries, to get on the housing ladder. So if things were to get worse, I mean, at what point does this break? At what point do people push back on what Christian calls the NIMBYs? I have no idea when things would change, but... It's clear that for the last 50 years, and especially the last 30 or 40 years, things have been getting much worse in terms of housing is much more expensive, either to buy as a fraction of your income, or as a fraction of your mortgage repayment costs as a fraction of your income, or to rent as a fraction of your income. It's, it's got a lot more expensive. Most goods haven't got more expensive. One thing that's worth thinking about is that a car, every year we get much better at delivering cars and making them cheaper because we have, we have new technologies and so on that we implement. We have robots. Now, houses in terms of actually building them has got cheaper and cheaper every year. But the cost to the person using the house or owning the house is much higher. Now, that, that be should case, be that's, right? that's surprising, right? I heard a stat the other day. Um, which I thought was very shocking, even as someone who follows this stuff, is that 40% of the entire net worth of the UK, so all the assets we have, all the stocks we own, all the factories we own, or everything, 40% of that entire total was planning permissions. So the value of land that has planning permissions, permission to build and stuff already on it, is worth about 40% of all the wealth in the UK. That um, is shocking. So, yeah, it's a big number. But I, but I, don't, I don't necessarily think that just because things are bad, that things will get better. There are loads of systems that just keep on getting worse for a long time. Oh gosh, let's, let's hope it can get better. Christian, what policy proposals would you put forward to make homes cheaper and to get more homes built? Yeah, we would have to start with the deregulation of the planning system. It is, as I mentioned, the British planning system is one of the most restrictive ones in the world, possibly the most restrictive one in the world. That means uh, it's, it's very difficult to get permission to get anything built, both in urban areas and around urban areas. So there are height restrictions. Uh, a lot of the Victorian terraces that are very popular today could not be built today because they would violate some height restriction. We also have restrictions around the cities where demand for housing is highest. London, Cambridge, Oxford, Bath, Bristol and so on have green belt areas around them. Green belt being a, a total misnomer. The green belt is not literally green. It's not an environmental designation or anything of that kind. It's not land that is particularly valuable from, from an environmental or uh, from an amenity value perspective. It is simply an area where you cannot build. It has no other purpose other than containing the cities within them. And something like 18% of all the land in England is green belt. 
the trouble is not so much that's a high proportion, but the problem is that virtually all of that land is uh, prime real estate. It's in areas with very high housing demand. So we get this uh, absurd situation that there is a lot of land where you could easily build on, which would not be a big loss in any other way. It's not that this is uh, that these are rolling hills of open countryside. This is often agricultural land, uh, very unattractive to look at, probably not even accessible to the public, would not even be in many cases commercially viable were it not for, for agricultural subsidies. So we got all that land where we could build quite easily, but it can't be done because it's green belt. Those two words have become totemic, that if land is classified as green belt, then uh, you cannot argue against it, or you will get accused of hating the countryside, of trying to concrete over the green and pleasant land. That is something that would have to be tackled. When you read, and Christian's right, when you look through, say, any small area, I went back to my parents' house, in, which is in Isha, and I was reading through the, the booklet of the Conservative MP, who's very free market guy, but he was saying, all of the people in the hustings were saying the first most important thing is that we'll protect the Greenbelt in our area. Now, I don't actually think that's because these people are in fact convinced that it is a beautiful rural landscape. I think it's because when you build more houses in an area, a lot of the things that you use are joint pool resources that can't be varied. So your roads in a local area just will get more congested. There's nothing you can do. You can't change that. Similarly, some other goods just don't respond to demand. So people worry about clinics, doctor's appointments, people worry about schools, and people worry about other government-provided resources. All things which, run by the state. Yeah, which don't, which don't respond. I would like to say, OK, well, why don't we like, introduce some market mechanisms into those things? This is just not going to happen. And even if it does happen, it's going to happen way later than we want to solve some of the housing problems. Uh, so I, I find it very hard to, to think about mechanisms, how we can solve this. But one would be something where you can see more directly how new housing benefits you. So a lot of people are worried about post office closing down or pubs closing down. I mean, you could tie these things more directly to those. People worry about potholes more than you can possibly believe. <laughs> Tying new houses to potholes being repaired is what is another thing. R repairing road surfaces, stuff like that. Running more bus services, running more trains, keeping a train station open. These are things people are worried about. The same people are worried about more houses ruining their quality of life, are worried about these things ruining their quality of life. You can build more schools and more clinics and hire more doctors with this money as well. That's the kind. If you can try and work that in, try and think of practical ways in which building can benefit local people, then you might be able to get consensus for building. Otherwise, I can only see it getting worse for a long time. Ben, to focus on the kinds of homes that we would be building, um, that's an important question, isn't it? It's not just about building more homes and getting more people on the housing ladder. It's the kind of homes that they're being offered and where they're being offered. Yeah, so as Christian said, it's the Greenbelt and other housing restrictions bite most deeply, I guess, in the places where people want the most. There are design restrictions on things. The London plan at the moment seems to require every apartment has access to some outside space and balconies fulfil that requirement. So if you see loads of balconies which you think seem a bit pointless on buildings, like very small ones where people mostly keep their bike, where there's not a nice view and stuff like that, that's probably a regulatory requirement. There's other things like the, the narrowness of stairs, the narrowness of houses. Um, some of these things will restrict the forms that people like to see in their buildings. But I, I think more important is the kind of non-house built environment. So if we want to get a lot of density out of an area, there's multiple ways of doing it. So one thing you can do is build up a lot. And Hong Kong obviously is one of the most dense places, or if not the most dense place in the world, because it goes very high. But another thing you can do is reduce the space between buildings. In history, we got quite dense medieval towns, villages, and cities. If you, I mean, if you go to most of Germany, you'll see their towns have very narrow streets everywhere. And it's, it's true across, across Europe. And this is one way you could do density without so much height and you could do it in different ways and you can make places more walkable um no one's specifically stopping that but it's there's just, just no it's just now. impossible with the overlapping jurisdictions if you're a developer you can't propose how a road is built mm -hmm. um so there's stuff like that which make it very difficult at the moment so to, many um, to do development yeah I, I, i'm not saying there's an easy solution to that but certainly under the current framework we can't achieve lots of things we could possibly achieve christian if we think about 
um, the regional aspect of house building and where the demand is. Uh, obviously, houses are in much more demand and much more expensive in areas like London in the southeast because it also happens to be where a lot of the good jobs are, where the center of things seems to be. Is there an argument that allowing regions to have more power, say, in setting the taxes that they have, corporation tax even, and um, building up regions might convince people to move out to where houses are cheaper? I would be in favor of that, but not necessarily for that reason. I don't think we should try to sort of fit the workforce of the country around the housing stock that we have. I think it should be the other way around. Houses should be built where people want to live rather than trying to cajole people to move where houses happen to be. This is the, the Simon Jenkins approach. He says uh, there are empty houses in the north, make force everyone to live in the north. Well, I'm slightly simplifying, but he does want to relocate the population in some way. But I don't think that's the way to go. We cannot really predict or control where the centers of economic activity happen to be. So 50 years ago, nobody could have predicted that London would have such a boom. London was for for quite a while a city that was losing population. It was not a a, a place where people wanted to live. It was a a place where people wanted to move away from. It's something that you cannot directly control or or steer or build. But I would nonetheless be uh, very much in favor of a much more decentralized tax system because that would uh, firstly solve the problem that we talked about before that part of the resistance is because we don't get the infrastructure that should be connected with that the public services the the streets and whatever it is that would almost automatically happen if you had a much more decentralized tax system because that would mean the places where residents move to these residents would not just be residents they would also be taxpayers the taxes they pay would stay in that area and you can then directly use that to provide the public services that they need and internationally that seems to be the case that more decentralized places don't have a big problem with housing. So uh, Switzerland is, is of course, um, probably the most decentralized country in the world. They've barely had any house price increases, uh, certainly not relative to incomes. So uh, house prices have gone up a bit, but incomes by much more. So affordability has improved. And part of the reason has to be that cantons and towns compete for residents. And when one way of attracting residents is to permit development. And once they have those residents, well, then they also pay taxes and then they can provide the public services that these people need. Ben, a lot of the criticisms around the lack of houses we have um, tend to fall on this issue of land banking, that developers are just hoarding land in the hopes that it's going to increase in value. Is this one of the reasons that we don't have as many homes? In a technical sense, it is, but in a more meaningful economic sense, it isn't. If you're pretty much any firm except for a house building firm, It's quite easy to just get the inputs you need in order to produce your product. If you need more, there might be some lag because the technical time to produce them. So say you make um, clothes. Finding more cotton, you might have to find a new producer, right? Or buy off the world market. That might take a little bit of time to get that cotton in order to make those new clothes. But it's not very much. So you don't need to cotton bank. But if you're a firm making houses in the UK right now, getting planning permission is so hard and so uncertain. You might spend, you know, £10 million on a bid two, three years redoing proposals, hiring the best lawyers, trying to get it through, and then it gets rejected, that you need to have lots of plots to keep in order to keep providing. Otherwise, you will run out and have a year where you can't produce. You have to fire all your workers or pay them for nothing. It's impossible to be a firm in the UK, build houses and not land bank. But it's only because of the system they're working within. In other countries, firms just don't land bank in the same way. When you can get planning permission fairly easy, or even not easily, but in a way that's predictable, you have to pay some certain amount or you have to go through a certain process, then you don't need to land bank. You can guarantee you will have the land you need to build the houses you need. Land banking is a red herring. It doesn't cause the problems. So Christian, this is a really important point that Ben's brought up because it fundamentally comes down to the uncertainty and, and also the, 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 the fluctuating regulations and, and not knowing what's going to be your obstacle going forward in order to build the homes. Um, and I think that takes us to the point of, of the politics of house building. It doesn't seem like any major party in the UK is really willing to address this issue. They keep bringing in small gimmicks like scrapping stamp duty for first time buyers, um, contributing to the help to buy scheme, but none of these things actually make houses more affordable for, for most people, especially if, if you're on a lower income. So what is the likelihood that any party will consider some of the policies we've spoken about today? And and what would it take to get them to do so? Likelihood is very small, I'm afraid, because of the, uh, the asymmetry that the people who would lose out from that, which is people who already own homes and might want to keep the value of those homes high, 
Uh, they are the ones who are best organized politically. So you, so you would alienate those people if you got a lot more houses built. But you won't automatically win the support from the people who would benefit. There would be people who benefit, but that, that would happen in a more abstract way. A couple of years down the line, houses might be getting cheaper, but the people who benefit might not attribute that to your policies. They might just think, for in, the, in the same way as when products in the supermarket get cheaper, you won't think, oh, surely this must be because of this policy or that policy. You would just think, oh, that's cheaper, good. Whereas there is a much more direct connection between the policy and the, the impact on, on the people who are losing out. So that's why they have a strong incentive to be actively politically engaged and uh, the people who might benefit don't have that. We, we saw that in the first year actually of the coalition government in um, 2010-11 when Nick Bowles tried a little bit to liberalize planning system, make it easier to to build new homes. And what happened then was there was a lot of resistance across several newspapers. There was there was something every day. They're trying to destroy the countryside and uh, screaming bloody murder. And that was probably something they expected. That was not a big surprise. But what was a bit surprising maybe was that there was nobody who seemed to be really in favor of this. So it wasn't controversial in the sense that some people were strongly in favor, some people were strongly opposed. No, it, it seemed as if everybody was uh, opposed to this. It, it may not have been a lot of people, but the ones who were opposed were very noisy and there was no other side. For a long time, the, the, the political calculation must have been that young people in particular, who pay the highest price for this, are not politically active anyway. They don't vote, they don't uh, join political parties, so it doesn't really matter. Ignore the young and keep homeowners happy. Now we've seen that that no longer quite works out, but nonetheless there's, there's no demand for from young people for specific policies that would really help. Ben, what do you think? Uh, Community Secretary Sajid Javid has come out with some hopeful things, particularly um, in the white paper that he put forward on housing, but there just didn't seem to be anything that was really going to fundamentally so I I, solve the housing crisis. Yeah, I don't think there was uh, much in the in the housing white paper itself, but it seems like he wanted to mm-hmm. put more in the housing white paper. He mentioned various schemes that I think would have made a big difference, but it was absolutely clear that he was personally taken down. His hands were tied. Yeah, by, by his... Uh, in fact, I think... If I had to guess at political strategy, and I'm terrible at those things, I suspect he knew he was going to be shot down, but he was trying to raise them as ideas in order to generate some popular support for them, or at least see if they could generate some of their own popular support. It didn't happen. The last budget, I thought, had some promising first steps, but only promising in the sense that we've given up on all things that would be a real big move, and we're just accepting any tiny moves that would make a, a, a positive but not gigantic difference. I think that in this particular case, not all of them, but there are a lot of politicians who are smart and understand the problem um, and would like to impose policies that I think would work, but they know that they are extremely unpopular. Let's say we buy the narrative that young people are worried about housing and that was one of the main reasons they voted for Corbyn and I think that's um, very possibly true. I don't think that many of that group connect building more houses with lower rents. I I just don't believe that most people believe in the supply and demand in housing. Um, So given that most people, most voters, don't believe in supply and demand in housing, they think that rents and prices are set by greedy developers arbitrarily. Um, They're just greedy, so they set high prices. They think that's the case. So homeowners think new houses will destroy my local area and they don't even make housing cheaper because they're not affordable houses. Young people who want to buy or rent a house um, think more building just makes developers richer and they're greedy developers and they're not even affordable. Um, I think that the only popular house pri- house issue would be rent caps. Rent caps doesn't hurt most homeowners, but it does help in the sense of in the short run, it makes their rents go down. Most people who are young and want to, buy, who, and want to rent a house, I think that's a, an absolutely winning policy um, in terms of the politics of it. I but think that's very depressing. Um, I don't think it's a good idea, but, uh, but I, think, I, I, I think there's so many obvious mental reasons why people oppose most of the things that me and Christian would think would make the housing market better. Whereas rent caps seems to only hurt landlords, you know, a widely hated group. Um, So why would anyone oppose it? Christian, um, last question. Do you think there's anything we could do to make our arguments stronger and resonate with the public more if Ben is right that a lot of people just don't connect supply and demand as being the issue in the housing crisis? 
You have to make it more tangible by talking about international comparisons. Just make clear how much of an outlier Britain really is when it comes to house prices uh, and housing costs generally. We have the highest house prices in Europe. We have the highest rent. And almost anywhere else in Europe, uh, you can get much better quality, larger housing units for a fraction of the price. And uh, that just shows that there's, there's nothing inherent in the housing market that makes it impossible or, or difficult to supply housing. And you don't even need to have some brilliant strategy. A lot of those housing markets are, are probably not following exactly the policies that we would want to see. They're not role models, but they're just doing okay. And in the housing market, that's all it takes. It's not actually that difficult to supply houses. It's something that is it's not a high tech sector. It's something that people have been doing for centuries, pretty much since we've left the caves, we've been building houses of some sorts. This isn't that difficult. It's just a matter of putting a few bricks on top of each other. So it can be done. We need, we, we need to talk about positive examples and make it more more easily visible need to make people think why can't we have that what is so different in the swiss housing market in the japanese housing market why don't they have the problems that we have ben do you concur with that yeah i mean look to japan is my best suggestion that's what i'm trying to get people to do now look to japan they have a buy right development system um, and they have falling house prices falling rents and rising space per capita even in places that have seen rising populations an optimistic example to end on thank you both for more blogs, podcasts, reports and films, go to our website iea.org.uk.